A world exists beyond that mundane little life that you live in. A world where intelligence is worshipped and pilots are God. A world filled with biotechnology that can save lives or end them. A war is brewing beneath the surface of everything you understand to be real. Ours is a tale of revenge, love, and desperate ambition. Will you come with us? I see you standing there Straight in an arrogant sweat I wouldn't give to tear you down Welcome to Episode 7 of Interface, The Creator's Champion. We're your hosts, Ellie Popov. And Charles Jazz Terrier. Well, listener, what are we waiting for? Tango waves around you It was early afternoon and the summer sun baked through the glass windows of the office and onto the back of Wyatt's neck. The large room was uncomfortably warm and Wyatt felt flushed, unsettled. His thoughts drifted back to the letter he'd received earlier from Crown Tech. What if it wasn't a practical joke from Greg? The man jerk had passed by his desk multiple times today without an unusual glance or additional snicker. The most he'd gotten from Greg so far was a chuffed wink when Crystal had met him in the middle of the room and slid a steaming coffee into his hands. Knowing Greg, if it had been he who had sent the letter, he'd be bragging about it all over the office by now. So, what if the letter was legitimate? What if the company behind the device he'd stolen from the floor of the circuit was really trying to get in touch with him? And what if this was his link back to Frey, Jasper, Fergus, and Isaiah? And how exactly was Crown Tech tied to the circuit games? Wyatt's memory flashed back to the man who'd worn the device, his eyes and actions crazed with a violence that had been played off as a bad ground cloud experience. But what if the attacker's motive had come from somewhere more... sinister? If his attack was linked to the Crown Tech device, and Wyatt could prove it, maybe this would give him the leverage he needed to prove himself to the team that had left him behind. If he could find them. The sluggishness brought on from the heat dissipated as this new thought took form. Wyatt rolled his shoulders, snatched the device from the desk surface, and left the main office. Wyatt paced down a corridor, with determination. Heading for the storage room, a place filled with odd cables and old scanners and printers, files and paper. He reached his destination quickly, and unencumbered by inquisitions or questions from surrounding colleagues. Not that he had expected anything less. He opened the plain white door and slipped inside the room. Natural light from a high window provided a soft warmth that gave Wyatt just enough illumination to see without forcing him to flick on the harsh bulbs of the fluorescence overhead. The Crown Tech device in one hand, Wyatt walked swiftly over to the shelves laden with the miscellaneous items that came with office hoarding and found his way over to the plastic container filled with connection cables. Wyatt unclicked the lid and dipped his hand into the tangled mess, retrieving a USB connection cable with a head that looked small enough to fit inside the device. Bingo. Poking the head into the Crown Tech's device receiver, he found there had been a decent fit. A little loose, but not something he couldn't work with. Pleased with himself, Wyatt clicked the lid of the container back on and shoved the box away from him. It slid along the shelf, banging lightly into the wall supporting it. Through the doorway to a partially hidden section of the storage room, Wyatt heard a woman ask in a soft, breathy voice, What was that? A man's voice answered, one that sounded simultaneously out of breath and encouraging. Nothing. Don't worry about it. Wyatt edged closer to the voices, hearing the slight thud of repetitive movement as if something was being rocked again and again. A low, feminine moan reached Wyatt's ears, matched by a series of guttural groans sounding from the deepest parts of the man's throat. Wyatt knew that voice. The man banging someone in the storage room was Greg. Walk away, Wyatt. His brain screamed the warning at him, but Wyatt continued to creep quietly forward, a force driving him towards the enclosed area, towards Greg, towards the woman. He had to know. He needed to see it. The rocking rhythm increased in pace, the thuds becoming so loud that Wyatt was sure the sound was probably echoing into the outside office corridor. Wyatt turned the corner. 
And there, with his back facing wide, was Greg. His obnoxiously loud, checked business shirt was undone and hanging off him ungracefully, his brown trousers fallen down around his ankles. Wyatt watched in disgust as the muscles in Greg's buttocks contracted in time to the thudding rhythm as he plunged himself over and over again into the woman's legs who were wrapped tightly around his waist. Greg obscured Wyatt's view of the woman, but Wyatt would recognize the smooth caramel of her skin anywhere. He shifted his footing slightly, glimpsing around the back of Greg's head to catch Crystal spread atop an ancient printer scanner ensemble that looked as if it belonged in the 90s. Her eyes were closed, and her beautiful face was thrown back in pleasure as Greg thrust again and again between her legs. Wyatt found himself caught in a trance as he watched the sway of Crystal's shining chestnut hair as Greg moved. How it trailed across her heavy breasts, exposed from her open crisp white blouse and cascaded down her back. Unexpectedly and without missing a beat, Greg angled his head towards Wyatt. His face was red with the effort of the carnal activity, his tongue protruding slightly from the corner of his mouth. But boy, did Greg look pleased with himself. Continuing his thrusts, Greg offered Wyatt a lofty wink before turning back to Crystal, rubbing a palm over her right breast. Stomach plummeting, Wyatt backed away from the couple and headed for the storage door. Escaping the room, Wyatt couldn't block out Crystal's deep moan of ecstasy as Greg stole from Wyatt everything he'd ever dreamt of giving Crystal. Closing the door securely behind him, Wyatt hovered in the corridor a moment, willing the goosebumps up his arms and the racking shoulder of disgust to fuck off. Willing himself to regain control, Wyatt knew somewhere deep down that he'd known Greg was sleeping with Crystal, that there was more between them than an office flirtation and some photos passed back and forth. But Wyatt's ignorance had been his bliss and his mental salvation. Wyatt fought the urge to double over and puke right there on the corridor's old, frayed carpet. From the pocket of Wyatt's pants, a beep sounded. He fished out his mobile phone and Wyatt read a notification across the screen. His downturned mouth cracked into a grin. His tracking software had successfully triangulated the location of Frey and Jasper's headquarters. Wyatt had found them. Twilight had set in as Wyatt pulled into the desolate car park of a small warehouse in the outskirts of Burley, a suburb to the south of the Gold Coast. Wyatt was surprised at the location. He'd been kidnapped and held only hours from his home. Somehow he expected more distance. But then again, nothing to do with any of this had worked out as he'd expected at all. Wyatt turned off the engine of his later model Toyota hatchback and glanced around the empty car park a feeling of dread settling over him. There was no sign of life emitting from within the warehouse, no glint of light through the cracks in the border windows. Don't get ahead of yourself, Wyatt. Wyatt cracked open the vehicle door and stepped out into the car park, closing the car up softly and careful to make as little noise as possible. With a deep breath, he approached the warehouse entrance. As Wyatt stepped closer, he was surprised to find the entrance door ajar, just slightly. He pushed it open with the toe of his foot. With the twilight fading fast behind him, Wyatt fished out his phone and activated the torch, stepping quietly into the darkness of the building. The reception was filled with nothing but dust and lingering footprints. Wyatt caught a light print of a boot, the sole design intricate and complicated. He knew by instinct it was phrase. Wyatt knew inside his guts they had been here. He'd found the right place. Like a ghost, Wyatt moved down a hall, swift-footed through the maze of rooms. He opened each door he passed, shining the torchlight bleakly through each darkened space. But they were all empty. Identically empty. Of any trace of Frey, Jasper, Fergus, or Isaiah. Turning a last corner, Wyatt came to the end of the hall, coming face to face with the closed door of the training room. Against Wyatt's will, his heart pumped and fluttered profusely like the wings of a dying bird and sweat gathered in the palms so thickly that he struggled to turn the knob of the door. He had to wipe his palms onto his shirt twice before he could even get the damn thing open. Alike with the other rooms, Wyatt was greeted with the dreaded darkness. His heart sank to the pit of his stomach as he raised the phone torch and shone it through the abyss of the room. Every last piece of gear had been removed, and despite the layer of dust that already covered the floor, there seemed to be not so much as a hair from his team left behind. 
Wyatt discovered not a single clue as he combed every inch of the room before finally admitting defeat and moving subconsciously to the room's center. He glanced towards the corner where Jasper was always seated before the computers running data and mocking him. Wyatt remembered Frey's feline stalk and the tilt of her head as she studied him. He moved to stand where Fergus's gaming station had been set up, and he glanced at the wall where Fergus's avatar had annihilated his own, like a shark tearing through the flesh of a helpless otter. They dumped Wyatt back home, and then they truly abandoned him. The camaraderie that had warmed between them all in the lead-up and during the circuit games was fake. Frey's kiss. Fake. Wyatt shuffled through the dust towards the training room's exit, pausing before the archway of the door. He turned to the right and visualized Isaiah, stoic and deadly, watching over him as both guard and executioner. Then Wyatt walked right out of the room and didn't look back. A clock of morbid darkness surrounded Jasper. The room was still and reeked of disinfectant. His body was cold and immobile, naked and collapsed on a long metal table. His eyes were taped closed, and from beneath the darkness of his lids, Jasper could sense the flicker of the overhead fluorescence. Though Jasper screamed, he couldn't hear a sound, and he doubted that anyone else could either. Around Jasper, his environment morphed, transforming into a rectangular room large enough to house twelve motionless bodies laid out on surgical beds. Almost like a phantom, Jasper looked down upon himself naked with a sheet drawn up around his waist modestly his chest bare and devoid of his Valkyrie tattoo. The unconscious Jasper beneath him was hooked up to a life support medical equipment, proof that he couldn't so much as breathe for himself. Likewise, the bodies around him, the soldiers he recognized, soldiers he'd laughed with and fought alongside, were identically entangled with medical machines. As Phantom Jasper spun, he could see the tanned face of Panda laid out on the surgical bed beside his. Panda's normally glowing skin sullen and pasty. He reached out to touch the man, his best friend, and his hand slipped right through Panda's massive an arm like a hot knife through butter. The room was heavy with the sound of mechanical breathing as each soldier's breath filtered through the machines at exactly the same time, tainting the room with a horrific rhythm that made Jasper's skin crawl. A small, Unexpected motion from the mouth of the long room caught Jasper's attention, and his gaze rose to see Frey, softer and younger than he knew her now. Her eyes looked right through Jasper's phantom figure, and instead studied each of the fallen soldiers with trepidation. Her youthful features made sharp with the torment of troubled thoughts. The wail of a dying Blackhawk helicopter engine cut through the sound of the soldiers' breaths, and Jasper found himself in the body of a man with a large hole blasted through his abdomen his thick hands slimy from the blood spilling over his palms as he struggled to hold his guts inside himself. His veins were thick with adrenaline, and even amidst absolute panic, Jasper knew his body was pumping his life force right out of him and emptying it onto the battlefield beneath. Jasper's eyes encircled his surrounds, glimpsing the partially charred soldiers around him. There had been five of them, his friends. Some of the soldiers still screamed in agony, others laid still their charred figures all that remained of his comrades. Behind him, the propeller of the chopper still swirled like a ferris wheel, despite the burning carcass of metal that was attached to. It cut into the ground viciously with each laborious circle. Cold, hard metal beneath his bare back roused Jasper from his burning agony, transporting him into a medical room, where he lay helpless, paralyzed inside his own naked body. Though he couldn't turn his head, Jasper knew that Panda was beside him. Jasper's eyes, open and unblinking outside of his control, watched in fear as Frey stood nearby, packing a large metal syringe with a metallic fluid. From beside Frey, two nurses appeared, and all three moved towards Jasper. Beyond his line of sight, the nurses rocked Jasper onto his side, and he felt the piercing pressure of the syringe in his lower back. The air around his tailbone turned glacial before the substance spread further, racing through his blood like morphine. Jasper's eyes opened and he found himself mid-laugh face-to-face with Panda in the locker room of their military base. Jasper sat on a bench with a towel wrapped around himself, still sweating from the heat despite the cool shower he'd had after training. He looked around at the unified grey colouring of the lockers lining the walls, then back at Panda's bulky form, half-dressed in green cargo pants and boots as he pulled the t-shirt from his locker. 
A grin etched across Panda's face. He opened his mouth to speak, only to be engulfed from behind by explosive flames that raced forward to catch Jasper too. Shrill and piercing, Jasper was pulled from the darkness by the sound of a bone drill pressed against his skull. The pressure built and then collapsed with a sickening crack as the skull gave way to the metal carving, a hole in his head, opening up the plush center of his brain. His body paralyzed, his eyes closed. Jasper could only watch behind blown out red lids as figures moved around him. He'd heard the quiet thud of the drill placed down and the click of metal tools as they were picked up and collided against one another. They stopped momentarily. The shift of a body beside him alerted Jasper that it was time to go again. Hands pressed against his skull and something hard and cold creeped into the soft tissue of his brain. Jasper couldn't control the silent screams that ripped from every inch of his body. Helpless, Jasper felt his brain tissue poked and prodded, and then something pushed inside. As if yanked from the depths of his nightmare, Jasper jolted awake. He sucked in a breath of air and twisted in his sheets, damp with sweat as his mind clarified where he was. Speckled light shone through the cracks in the paper windows and highlighted the small room filled with his makeshift bed and few personal belongings. His boots in the corner near the door. Jasper was where he was supposed to be, with Frey and Fergus and Isaiah fighting to make the world a better place. He couldn't say the same about Panda. Heaving his muscular frame into a sitting position, Jasper moved his hands around his lower body, feeling the skin across his back. And there it was the implant at the base of his spine grounding him into his reality. Jasper reached for his phone, situated behind a two-thirds drunk bottle of whiskey. He checked the time. Early morning. The rest of the team were likely already up. He dragged himself out of bed and pulled on a tank and some track pants before making his way blearily to the kitchen. Minutes later, he entered the control room. Black coffee and a foam cup in hand. As he'd expected, Frey was seated before a computer system, poring over data. Fergus was to the side of her at a workbench, fiddling with some kind of device. From the back of the room, Isaiah let out a spin kick that hit the training bag with such a loud whack that it echoed throughout the room, causing Frey and Fergus to spin in their seats. Frey eyed Jasper wearily as he sculled the last of his sweet black coffee, crumpled the foam cup, and swiped up a tablet from Frey's desk as he approached her. Frey's gaze roved him warily before deciding he was ready to cope with her sarcasm. She let loose. Nice of you to join us. Where are we at? Jasper asked, eyeing the screen filled with the pilot data in front of them. Nowhere yet. Jasper swiped across the screen of the tablet in his hand, data from the first round of the circuit games loaded before him. Surely we've missed one, he remarked, studying each face and their statistics as he swiped by. Ninja? No. Hunter? He quirked an eyebrow at Frey, who caught his look unimpressed. Yeah, no. Pirate? And that was over before it began. As Jasper rattled each name off, he watched Frey get more and more irritated. He couldn't help but push her. Tatiana? Nope. Viper is colorblind. Rabbit? Hell no. Jasper paused. Banshee's picture capturing his attention. He scrolled down to the top of her statistics. Banshee. He turned a hopeful, questioning look to Frey, who remained focused on the screens before her. Her motor neural data doesn't make the grade, she said dismissively. Jasper glanced down at the tablet in his hand. Yes, it does, he protested. Scroll down. Jasper used the tip of his index finger to scroll further down through Banshee's performance percentages and furrowed his brow in frustration as her statistics depreciated. Frey was right. Damn it. Frey still didn't so much as glance at him her eyes glued to her multiple monitors. Anyone illegible is already through. There has to be someone left. Jasper watched a flicker of annoyance pass over her face at his challenge, but Frey remained silent and focused. There were a lot of things that pissed Jasper off about Frey. Her know-it-all attitude for one. But he had to admire her self-control. It did beat his. Every time. He continued to scroll right through the pilot data on the tablet until the very first circuit games five years ago. The contenders popped up one by one, dragging back Jasper's memories with them. The excitement, the hope that they all had that the circuit would help them create something that would change lives. With each passing swipe, he knew he was getting closer to the pilot that had kicked everything off with them. The pilot that still reigned truer than any other. Tempest. 
Her name in his mind still built a feeling of dread. In the pit of his stomach, a spike of pain, a rush of lust. That she could still have such an effect on him. Jasper swiped again and the fiery red hair shone up from the screen. Tempest's green eyes gazed into his. Before he could shut it down, Jasper remembered the emerald glow of Tempest's eyes as she looked down at him, his head between her legs, ecstasy from the orgasm she'd ridden out on his tongue still evident all over her face. Jasper slammed his mind's eyes shut harshly, frustration getting the better of him. He tossed the tablet onto Frey's desk where it clattered loudly on the surface. Frey zoned in on Jasper. I know you're trying to be helpful, but trawling through old pilot data that's already photographically etched into my memory is not only irritating, but it's a complete waste of time and battery power. Being irritated is going to be the least of your worries if we don't fill this quota, Jasper shot back. Frey glared at him, her eyes as fiery as Tempest's hair. Not for the first time, he wondered how he'd managed to put such strong, bad-tempered women in powerful positions in his life. I'm well aware of what's at stake. Thank you for the reminder, Frey said stoutly. Jasper fought down the urge to arc up. He didn't feel like she had the right to be this pissed at him. In fact, if anything, he should be pissed off at her. Frey had knowingly put them all into a situation he'd come to realize was an almost impossible situation. Here they all were, in a race of time, seeking underrated, unacknowledged, covert super geniuses that not only needed the right skill set and IQ, but the personality profile to match. And only then, when they had six of these rare, practically non-existent specimens, could the interface bid move forward with the board members of the Armed Forces Organization. Providing another bid didn't overtake them in the meantime. Finding all six champions would be life-changing for so many. And for Jasper, it meant the return of structure, normality. He could sleep in the same bed every night, build relationships with people outside of this covert tech team. Jasper could have some kind of life back. Maybe he'd even meet a nice girl for once. But if they couldn't pull the interface bit over the line, Jasper would have no control over what he was thrust into next. A man utterly owned by the armed forces organization. A man who had no choice. But Freya? Well, she was Julian's golden child, as close to a daughter as he was ever likely to have. Now she would have a future. She would not be tossed aside or pushed out onto the front lines. She would not suffer as he would. Jasper sat on the side of her desk, invading Frey's personal space. Five years and it's all going to crap because we're down by one? By one! Frey ignored the tone in Jasper's voice, returning her attention to her work not helping. Exhaling loudly in frustration, Jasper took his anger out on the styrofoam cup in his hand, biting a chunk out of its foamy flesh. After a moment, he said, You might have missed something. Frey's lips tightened in anger before she spun to face Jasper again, her expression clearly admitting her anger. From the desk next to her, Fergus, who had been silent during the whole exchange, finished screwing the last bolt into his device. She never misses anything, Fergus stated simply oblivious to Jasper's frustration. Fergus turned his device this way and that, inspecting his handiwork. Jasper was in utter disbelief. First Frey, and now Fergus. Hell no. Jasper pegged his styrofoam cup at Fergus and watched with satisfaction as it collided with the back of the man's head. Fergus, shocked, swiveled to face Jasper, a frown painted on his features. Frey threw a disgusted look at Jasper. Don't throw things at Fergus, child. Thank you, Frey, said Fergus graciously. Jasper pushed off Frey's desk and paced the floor behind her. Do you have any better use for my talents? His words were heavily laden, a challenge to her, and Jasper knew that Frey knew that too. Frey's gaze bore into his own. You have two options. Be patient. Or, Jasper dared her, Fergus passed his completed device to Frey, the contraption proving to be a computer part. Jasper watched as she plunged it into her main machine, and the computer search scanned with an increased threefold speed. Fergus smiled at the outcome. Frey returned her gaze to Jasper. Go and hit things with Isaiah. Let the grown-ups work. Jasper let out a disbelieving, frustrated chuckle. If that's how she wanted things to be, so be it. 
Turning his attention towards the back of the room, Jasper approached the sweaty Isaiah who finished executing a jab-jab elbow combo before leaning over to a side shelf to retrieve some hand wraps. The big man tossed him at Jasper who pulled his tank off and proceeded to wrap his hands around the fabric, watching Fergus and Frey out of the corner of his eye. Now that Jasper was out of arm's reach, Fergus had maneuvered himself behind Frey, leaning over her shoulder. So, what's the strategy? Jasper heard Fergus ask Frey. She paused before answering, watching identification photographs flash across the screens as the search software cycled through. We wait, she finally answered. Maybe pray a little. Frey leaned back in her padded computer chair and stifled a yawn. It was creeping closer to midnight, and though she would never admit it to anyone, she hadn't been sleeping well. She was restless, in fact. Her mind a jumble of memories. Memories of him. Memories of Wyatt. Memories of the time beyond five years ago when things seemed simpler and the future of so many people didn't rely on her ability to find a human that neared on genius. Six humans with such traits, to be completely clear. Jasper's intense thumping behind her as he beat his fists into the punching bag that was hung towards the back of the control room sounded repetitively, a reminder of the unnaturally harsh thudding of her heart. Frey was fully aware of Jasper's frustrations with her, and why. Part of her felt like she deserved it, but the other part of her, the bigger part, knew that they had to see this out. This was for the greater good. It would all be worth it. The feed on Frey's monitor screens flicked over the data of new potential candidates listed as James Smith. She leaned forward as the program stuttered towards an ID card. It flickered again and then froze up. What the hell? Fergus, who had entered the control room carrying a hot cup of tea, approached Frey's desk. Jasper and Isaiah paused their throwdown with the punching bag to join them. Disbelief was etched onto every single one of their faces. Someone had breached their program. Her fingers on fire, matching the rage that shook bubbling inside of her chest. Frey launched a series of firewalls, attempting to lock out the breach as fast as possible. The riddle of code bounced back and forth between the foreign hacker and herself. But Frey couldn't lock them out. Against her every effort, she was thwarted, and the hacker's connection stabilized inside her system, like chains locking around the heart of her code. Frey's team was silent around her, as her monitors all turned black, interchanging with the appearance of a white cursor. A single sentence began to spell out across the screen as Frey sucked in her breath. Hello, Frey. I'm ready to play. Frey watched on in a curious type of horror as the text flashed three times on all the monitors before the screens blackened again. Then, a smiling face exactly like the one Frey had drawn on Wyatt's hand before the placement round of the circuit games appeared on the screens simultaneously. The face seemed to be beaming at her in a type of mocking challenge. Wyatt! Wyatt had tracked them down and hacked into the interface system, and Frey had no idea how that sneaky, low-performing loser had managed to do so. But most importantly, Frey knew the son of Elizabeth Hawking couldn't have access to Julian's system. Frey needed to get him out. Now. The smiling face faded enough for the hacker to show the team Frey's protective systems as they began to crash, unlocking her encrypted folders. Frey's files began to open before them, starting with the specs of her gloves, which Wyatt plastered across every monitor. Damn it, Frey growled loudly, her continuous attempts at locking Wyatt out fruitless. The glove specs were replaced with the live feed of Panda's charred and weathered death sight. Like an unexpected blow to the face, Frey felt the pain and nausea rising inside her. From behind her, Fergus shouted, Pull the plug! Like a twirling cyclone of fire, raw grief and pure rage clouded her mind, filled her vision, boiled her insides, and Frey struggled to shake it off and see through the storm. She couldn't pull the plug, not with all their progress spiraling straight down the drain. If I do that, we lose track of the program's search parameters. Suddenly, 
the live feed shut off, switching instead to a video file. The low quality was indicative of a home movie. Frey's stomach sank as she recognized Panda and her younger self together in her old bedroom. The camera, an early, more clunky drone model, hovered beside the bed where younger Frey sat, working at her laptop, attempting to ignore Panda's antics. Check it out, an exuberant Panda said to her, feigning obliviousness to her chosen ignorance. Wing's surveillance has had a makeover. Frey's eyes rose from the screen of her laptop, unimpressed. Panda, go put that thing back in the lab. Panda's tanned, handsome face cracked into a cheeky grin. Wait, you haven't seen the best part. Panda left the drone to fend for itself, the contraption wobbling in the air as it stabilized. The big man bounced over to the bed and flopped down beside Frey, chuckling as the motion almost caused her to unbalance the laptop resting on her legs. Panda placed the remote to the device down beside him and waved to the drone. Look, Mom, no hands. Frey couldn't help but laugh at the beautiful man beside her. Panda rounded on her, a gleam in his golden brown eyes. I don't know why you're laughing. This is serious. Hands free is the most important function. He quirked a brow. Here, see? Panda pulled Frey towards him, easily sliding her body into his arms. His free hands roamed swiftly up under her shirt, kissing her deeply as he lowered her back onto the bed. As the two bodies intertwined, Frey moved her hand to grab the remote. Panda caught the maneuver and looked at her slyly. Leave it on a little longer. The video came to an end and present day Frey felt sick to her stomach. She watched as Wyatt began to type. The message was slow going and she knew she had him at a disadvantage. God, she thought. His wall was down. She punched in a sequence and put an end to his invasion. As the words, Frey, I'm so so spread across the screen, Frey hit enter, allowing the code to kick Wyatt out of her system, locking him out for good. She ripped out the plug that fed the electricity to her system harshly, tearing the PowerPoint a little away from the wall as she did so. Her monitors cut to black. Frey turned around to face a stunned Jasper and Fergus, a stoic Isaiah. You've been hacked, Fergus announced unnecessarily, shocked and amazement filling his voice. That's impossible. Frey snapped, her tone seething with sarcasm. Really? Jasper clocked her expression and turned to Fergus. Frey didn't like the way the corner of his lip twitched, as if amused as if realizing something. What the hell? He questioned out loud. Frey watched as Fergus and Jasper's eyes met. The oversaturated glow of The Bachelor showing on John's television cast across Wyatt's father's face and bathed the room in the same digital light. Wyatt wondered why his father insisted on watching brainless television like this. Could it be that John was vicariously living the dreams of a younger man with numerous women treading all over each other in pursuit of him? Or was it that John believed that drivel like this was the trend of the younger generation and was using this series as another ill-acquired tool to bond with Wyatt? Likely, Wyatt would never know. John would never tell him. Wyatt and his father never spoke so candidly to each other. Wyatt lifted an MSG-drenched forkful of Chinese takeout noodles into his mouth and glanced over the sole decor in his father's bare lounge room, a photograph of Lizzie, a much younger version of his mother, smiling in denim overalls. The shining green trees of a nature park glittered in the sunlight behind her. Wyatt then looked sidelong at his father, who was oblivious to the tension between them. Get us another beer, would you, mate? Wyatt's father asked, his mouth still thick with food, his eyes locked to the television screen. Don't you think three's enough? Wyatt was careful to keep a monotone in his voice. His father and Wyatt often clashed over John's beer indulgence, and John thought it was a nice way to wind down for the day. Wyatt argued that going through a six-pack every night made John an alcoholic, and John rounded on Wyatt attempting to hold back the bulk of frustration evident in his useless poker face. Thought it was a cheat night. Isn't that how you trapped me into this dieting crap in the first place? Guess your own beer, Dad, 
The abruptness in Wyatt's tone caused his father to come up short and eye him curiously. Wyatt avoided John's gaze. What's your problem? John asked directly, watching his son push around the last of his noodles in his cardboard takeout container. Nothing. Wyatt, alert to his father's sudden interest, shrugged his shoulders lightly. But John wasn't that easily deterred. Come on, out with it. I said I'm fine, Wyatt tried to shut the conversation down. Wyatt's father chuckled roughly, amused. You never could lie, mate. Even as a kid. Wyatt grew silent, ignoring the sudden glint in John's eye. His father continued. I remember when you broke Nana Dai's favorite teacup. Tried to blame it on the dog. You point the finger, but your face gave it away. John paused a moment. Never play poker. You get that from your mother. The sound of the bachelor filled the sudden silence between them. Both men unsure what to say now. It was always like that when Lizzie was raised. Though, usually it was Wyatt doing the raising and John shutting his mouth. What's her name? What's her name? Wyatt looked at John, further surprised at his father's insight. Who? The Sheila you're pining over. What's her name? John prodded. Wyatt sighed and leaned back against the couch, tilting his head to rest along the top. He considered how much to tell his father and how much to admit to himself, which one he was pining over. Trouble. Her name is Trouble. A glance at his father showed Wyatt the concern in John's eyes for his son, something that made Wyatt unexplainably uncomfortable. He avoided his father's gaze, his own eyes shifting back onto the photo of Lizzie. Did you ever look deeper into what Mom did for work? Wyatt looked sidelong back at John, watching the man's expression change abruptly, tightening into a wall as impenetrable as concrete. I have not had enough beer to have this conversation, mate, John finally uttered harshly. But that answer wasn't good enough for Wyatt. Not this time. Wyatt had always believed that there was more to his mother's death than what John had told him. Maybe more than John had even been told himself. But Wyatt was a grown man now. Hell, look at the shit he'd just been mixed up with. That he was trying to find his way back to. His recent experience had taught Wyatt that there were layers to everything. And most people only ever wanted to peel back the surface. Not Wyatt, though. He wanted to know everything. Dad! He pushed fiercely. The voice that broke from Wyatt was more the voice of a man than a begging child. John almost cringed in shock. Wyatt watched John take a deep breath, his face reddening in anger. His voice exploded over the top of the heavy makeout session happening on the television. The organization she worked for are a dangerous bunch of pricks, all right? It got her killed. His father stopped short as if to refrain from spilling more information, but Wyatt wasn't going to just drop it that easily. Not when he was so close to the truth that he could smell it on John's beer drenched breath. But did you ever, John snapped, of course I bloody did. There's nothing there, nothing but bull and red tape. His father's solid frame leant in closer, eyes boring into Wyatt's trying to drive his message home. Don't go digging around, Wyatt backed up an inch, trying to put some breathing room between them. But I said, drop it. Wyatt's breath caught in his throat, and he couldn't fight the anger and the pain that flashed through him like a raging, vicious flood. John's own emotionally ravaged face proved that he could see it too. Abruptly, Wyatt stood up headed into the kitchen and wrenched the fridge door open. The fridge was mostly empty except for a cluster of glass beer bottles lining the top two shelves. Angrily, he yanked a beer out of the top shelf, one left among nine or so. The side only fueled him further. He strode back into the lounge room and tossed the beer roughly at his father, who caught it out of pure instinct alone. John's eyes were wide, probably wondering if the two of them had crossed the line they wouldn't come back from. And if so, Wyatt was wondering the same thing. Oh, come on, mate. John tried to reason as Wyatt made hastily for the apartment's exit. I'm sorry. I leave again tomorrow. Come on, come back and sit with your old man. I'll see you when you get back, Wyatt said flatly from the threshold of the front door as he shuffled his feet back into his shoes. Then he left, slamming the apartment door behind him without so much as a backward glance. Wyatt entered his room in a rush, launching his computer system and allowing the machinery to break through the darkness before he bothered to turn on his nearby desk lamp. The glow illuminated the filth in his room, the unwashed dishes that had continued to accumulate, rubbish that littered the floor, and the clothing he'd worn competing in the circuit games which was still crumpled at the foot of his unmade bed. 
but keeping things tidy just wasn't a priority. Not when he'd been struck with another idea on the way home from his father's apartment. Throwing himself into the chair before his computer desk, Wyatt rested his chin on a folded hand, waiting for his tech to kick all the way on. His eyes drifted past a couple of empty cups of noodles and settled on a stark, white envelope, not unlike the one that had shown up at Lion Insurance. In fact, it was exactly like the one discarded at work, down to the print addressed to Wyatt Hawkins on the front. Wyatt turned the envelope over, acknowledging Crown Tech's seal before scanning his room carefully. So carefully, he hardly dared to breathe, listening for a strange rustle or a half-expected misplaced footstep by an intruder. Seconds passed, but Wyatt heard nothing beyond the electrical buzzing of his machine and saw nothing more than an unkempt room of a man who just didn't give much of a fuck. Rising quietly from his chair, Wyatt crept over to a window, eyes pouring over the darkened street below. No sign of anything covert or strange. He let out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding and folded himself back into his desk chair. Envelope still in hand. Wyatt tore it in half and then again, before discarding them haphazardly onto the surface of his desk, swiping the shredded pieces to the side, out of his way. Crown Tech were a persistent bunch, clearly. Wyatt didn't want to have to think about how they tracked down where he lived, been inside his home, paced inside his walls to leave him instructions. Demands. Crown Tech, wherever they were, had invaded Wyatt's security, crossed the boundary into his sacred space. Despite his rejection of their first round of communication, Wyatt knew it didn't make sense. But although Frey, Jasper, Isaiah, and Fergus had kidnapped him, held him against his will, and essentially manipulated him into competing in the circuit games for the purpose of their own agenda, whatever that might actually be, there was no deep dreading fear when he thought of them. No alarm bells telling him to get the fuck out or stay the hell away. In fact, Wyatt's very insides begged him to find them. Begged Wyatt to work smarter, faster, and locate them before he missed his shot. When Wyatt thought of Crown Tech, his skin crawled. Fishing his hand into his pocket, Wyatt retrieved the crown device that the tech company was so desperate to get back and placed it onto his desk. Fishing again, he pulled out the cable he'd taken from the storage room. Against his will, a visual of Greg pumping into Crystal flashed up behind his eyes, and White shuddered, remembering Crystal's bouncing, bare breasts and breathy moans, Greg's thickness between her legs. He couldn't stop the feelings of jealousy and resentment that swarm up either. Crystal hadn't wanted Wyatt, and even thought of Wyatt like that, but let that disgusting, egotistical, macho wannabe infiltrate her. He didn't understand it. Why beautiful women always went for the slimy fuckboys. Why guys like Wyatt were never enough. But Frey saw you. Wyatt's mind spoke to him. Yes. Frey did see him. Wyatt's computer now fully awake, he plugged the stolen cable into a USB port at the front of the machine before lifting the Crown Tech device into the light of his desk lamp for one last inspection. Satisfied with what he saw, Wyatt cautiously plugged the other end of the cable into the device and waited. For a moment, nothing seemed to happen. His computer didn't even register the presence of the device. But, after a few seconds, a light at the base of the device activated. A warning flickered to life across Wyatt's frontal monitor. Unauthorized access, defense protocol initiated. His heart thumped painfully in his chest, and Wyatt hastened to rip the cable out of the device only to be beaten by whatever security software Crown Tech had impregnated their technology with. The crown exploded with a blue flash and puffed up into a cloud of smoke frying the tech in his hands. Wyatt dropped the device as it burned in his fingers and coughed as the chemical haze infiltrated his lungs. Wyatt clambered to open the window behind his desk, plonking himself back down. He dropped the tech into his waste bucket and exhaled, long and slowly willing himself to think clearly, to stay in control. It didn't matter that he killed the tech. It wasn't theirs anyway. He needed to focus. Wyatt, leaning against the backrest of his chair, cracked his knuckles as he thought his idea through. He sat up straight and leant towards his monitors. Pulling up his search history and studying his screens, he scrolled through the data determinedly. Come on, where are you? Why could you just scroll through the moments more before something else dawned on him? There could be another way. You'll be looking for someone else, he mused out loud, liking how it sounded on his tongue. You had a program. Wyatt's mind flashed a phrase screen in his training room. Interface. 
find or know. He shook his head, focusing on the white print against the black background like a DOS panel. Interface. Seeker. Yes. Filled with exhilaration, White's fingers pumped the keys of the keyboard, dancing across the letters and numbers. Swiftly, White funneled his system through a new, unique VPN before fabricating a performance trail for Frey's software to find. He clasped his hands together, waiting and watching. White had taken on the persona of a new potential candidate. The algorithms shift on his monitor screens, sequencing over and over again. Fifteen minutes went by, then half an hour, still. Why could not pull himself away from his computer. Finally, just shy of the hour mark, a familiar eerie panda skull appeared across his computer screens. Got you! Wyatt shouted to himself, shifting forward into the glow of his screens. Wyatt's fingers soared across his keyboards, manipulating Frey's own coding, twisting it into his own needs. And then, Wyatt found a back door in. Wyatt's hue was a ghostly digital glow as he leant in so close to his central monitor that his nose almost touched the screen. He knew without a doubt that he'd access something Frey would never want him to see, wouldn't want anyone to see. He crossed a line, but he'd also shown his skills. He'd made a good play for them and they had to know it. Wyatt had never believed in God. In fact, after the death of his mother, Wyatt had firmly believed that if there was a God, and that's a big fucking if, then he and God had a serious problem. Why should Wyatt or humanity period worship a deity that gambled their lives and their mentality on a standoff with the devil? Was the life of Wyatt's mother worth proving a point to Satan? But now, in this moment, almost without thinking about it, Wyatt found himself beginning to pray. He crossed his fingers and stared at the screen. Dear God, let them take me back. Let it be enough. Wyatt held his breath. Almost instantly an error message appeared. He'd lost the feed. And now Wyatt was out of ideas. He felt his body curl in on itself before he was even aware. Wyatt's arms and legs pulling into his core as if protecting his body, as if warming the cold, sinking feeling that was creeping into his heart. The carpet in the control room was old, dirty and dusty, and it gathered on the soles of Jasper's feet in an uncomfortable clinging way as he paced the patch of floor behind Frey's computer setup as she rebooted the system. His face was an unreadable wall of emotion, a contrast to Frey's strained expression. As the system flickered to life and the screens turned on, Jasper could see that Wyatt's smiley face emoticon seemed to have saved as the wallpaper for each one. Frey looked as if she might punch the monitors themselves. It was an interesting turn of events, Jasper thought, that Frey had been right about the kid after all. Whatever had happened between Wyatt and Tempest in that ring had caused Wyatt to choke, but after today's little show, Wyatt had proved that he had more potential and a better skill set than any other candidate they'd seen in a long time. Perhaps even more than Tempest. Maybe it was time Jasper reminded Frey of the positives of Wyatt's recent field trip through her software. Jasper cleared his throat. <clears throat> the kid's got some balls. He trailed off awkwardly as Frey ignored him and scowled at the smiling totem. Please, read directly below the totem lingering appeal left behind after Wyatt's brutal exile. Good lord, Fergus breathed softly. He bent around the desk to flick a switch that caused a security alert to flash across the screens, erasing Wyatt's calling card. He then backed out from beneath the desk and resumed his stance near Frey, who had pushed herself away from her setup, looking positively furious. A little behind them all, Isaiah was wordless. Jasper couldn't stop the twitch of his mouth forming into an ill-kept smirk as he considered Wyatt's tactical invasion. He clearly wanted back in. And what better way to prove his worth and ability than to hack their system? And Jasper knew. He couldn't have done a better job if he tried it himself. Wyatt's only misstep was... I don't know what you're so happy about, Frey's angry voice cut through Jasper's thoughts. You just interrupted the program. Rebooting is going to take time we don't have. Jasper ignored Frey's tone and continued his pacing, his mouth breaking into a full smirk. He hacked you, he clarified out loud, just in case she had missed it. He actually hacked you. Frey shot Jasper an annoyed look. Yes. Thank you, Captain Obvious. She turned back to Fergus. Fergus, could you go reboot the generator and restart the servers? We've got to get this search back up and running. Frey slumped back into her chair and pushed some loose hairs from her dark, curling mass away from her face. Jasper couldn't believe it. The answer was so clear. You don't need it. He pushed upon her. 
saying the words out loud that she clearly didn't want to hear, made even more evident by the look of disgust that graced her pretty features. Jasper grabbed the back of her chair and wheeled her back towards the desk where he pulled up the diagnostic report from Wyatt's hack, forcing her to see the data. Frey refused to go down this path with him. Unless you've got a new pilot hiding up your skirt, we certainly need it. Softly, and in the same delicate tone that matched his features, Fergus spoke up, cluing onto Jasper's tactic. Perhaps he does. Jasper looked over his shoulder at Fergus, who exchanged a careful look with him. He returned his attention to the system before him and tweaked the monitor on the far left towards Frey in a way she couldn't ignore. The monitor showed Wyatt's smiling totem. He enlarged the totem, delivering the message to Frey unavoidably. Frey glanced between Fergus and Jasper, outraged by their unified resolve. No, absolutely not. She pushed her chair back from the desk again, almost running over Jasper's bare feet in the process, and stood to leave, making for the exit. We need to play him as a wild card, Jasper protested. Frey. Frey halted mid-stride. He chokes, Jasper. End of story. Jasper tried to think of a way to appeal to Frey around her words. The woman was so fiercely strong and stubborn. He knew that she'd been hurt. He knew the rawness of that intimate video flashing up before them had reopened her wounds of Panda that had never really healed. For any of them. But for Panda's death to be worth anything, they needed this. They needed the interface bid to go through, and it was bigger than Frey's pride, and bigger than any of them. He was undercut by Tempest, Jasper tried, hoping Frey's hatred for the champion would work in Wyatt's favor. Otherwise, he would have won. He's the best option we've got. Frey completely ignored him. Fergus, get everything up and running. We'll boost the program and get it to run a wider search. Jasper took a pain step in Frey's direction, pushing down his own fluctuating emotions to stay focused on the task at hand. Frey, he just hacked your system. I thought that was impossible. Frey's face blanched at Jasper's blunt statement. Fergus attempted to be a voice of reason, wary of the heat rising between his two teammates. The aptitude required to complete such a task is, in fact, highly improbable, bordering on impossible, he said gently. Jasper pointed a finger at Fergus, who rounded on Frey. See? If he can find a backdoor into your systems, he'll be able to do the second round standing on his head but Frey didn't look likely to budge at Fergus and at Jasper's joint appeal. Come off it, she snapped. It's one thing to perform party tricks from the safety of your own bedroom. It's a completely different story to do it where it counts, and Frey hesitated before plunging forward, another message buried underneath her words. And you know it. Fergus interjected again, concern growing more evident on his face by the second. Frey, if I may. No, Fergus, you may not, she barked at him. This is not up for debate. Frey's blow at Fergus absolutely infuriated Jasper. How dare she speak to Fergus like that? To any of them like that? They were all here risking their lives for her and her technology and her AFO as members of a collective team for the greater good. Not for her to order them around in a tantrum like slaves. They were equals. This decision wasn't just up to her to decide. The hell is wrong with you? Jasper couldn't help the rise in his voice the pent up emotion over this whole situation bubbling to the surface and spewing out with his words. All the resentment and anger. That kid's just done the unthinkable and you're acting like it doesn't mean anything. Frey's voice filled with sarcastic venom. Yes, okay, he can have a gold star for getting one up on me. It doesn't mean he's ready for a second round. Are you kidding me? Jasper challenged, disbelieving laughter underlying his words. I'm trying to protect this team, this whole operation from becoming undone. Jasper took another step towards Frey, her eyebrows scrunched in her own resolve. So am I, he bit back, Jasper's voice dangerously low. Jasper was practically head to head with Frey now, through two bodies less than a third of a meter apart. He took sadistic pleasure in the knowledge that he was drowning Frey in the rancid bad breath combination of old whiskey and the vivid tang of black coffee. It probably wasn't pleasant for her, he probably didn't care. Fergus watched their exchange like a tennis match, his eyes bouncing from Jasper to Frey and back again. Jasper knew the man was measuring if he needed to jump between them. Likewise, the silent Isaiah kept his position a little away, though poised for an escalation. Frey took a breath and shook her head at Jasper, denying him. No, you're impressed, and you're being impulsive. If he was a woman, you'd be trying to get into his pants right about now. Frey's eyes narrowed as she continued, taking a running jump over that emotional line between them. Oh wait, you did that already. Her smile was over-exaggerated, 
and she used it to drive her point home. That's how we got into this mess in the first place. Deep down in Jasper's core, Frey's words hit a nerve that there was no coming back from. Tempest had been the best and the worst thing that ever happened to him. Just like Frey had loved Panda with her very soul, so had he with Tempest. Only Frey was never put in the position where she'd had to allow Panda to believe she was cheating on him with Jasper to protect their covert mission. That had been what had set Tempest off. That had been the true cause of her betrayal. The woman hadn't had it in her to trust Jasper despite her instincts. Despite every rule and lesson she'd ever learned, she could never put Jasper and the love above the whispering voice in her head that screamed, traitor. And so, Tempest had left Jasper vindicated by her return betrayal of him, and it had been war between them ever since. And now for Frey to throw his sacrifice in his face? No more. Jasper stood his ground with Frey harsher than he'd ever been to her, the woman who had saved him from death, yet trapped him in a kind of life he'd never wanted, without his friends, without his family, without love. The last time someone hacked your system, you took him to bed within the blink of an eye and mounted him on a pedestal. So don't get high and mighty with me. Frey let him finish, eyes glued to his. After a long minute, she responded, her voice dangerously gentle. You can be quiet now. But Jasper wasn't anywhere near finished. He wanted to explode. He wanted Frey to feel how he felt inside. She had given him life again, yes. But he had given her everything. He had lost everything. And he didn't do it to be ordered around like some subservient puppet from a woman with a superiority complex who refused to see the solution right in front of her nose because of her own ego. As if reading Jasper's thoughts, Fergus tried again to calm the tension between them. Jasper, his voice both a warning and an appeal. Why? He's dead, Frey. He can't hear me, Jasper shouted past the point of no return. You're letting his memory cloud your judgment because you were just humiliated. So don't stand there and make me out to be the bad guy when you're the one running like hell from your demons at the expense of this whole operation. Frey met Jasper's truth with silence, her eyes staring Jasper down with a look that could melt bone from flesh. From the sidelines, even Fergus flinched from the animosity radiating from Freya. Jasper barely heard her intake of breath before she calmly turned on her heel and exited the room. Once she was out of sight, Jasper felt his own emotions retract their tentacles from his racing pulse. Those spats between himself and Frey were not uncommon. They had both gone too far this time, and neither of what each had said to the other was fair. Jasper and Frey, they were both in this together. Together, they had been through hell, and Jasper did owe Frey or his life. The life he had now, which part of him knew was better than no life at all. But tonight, Jasper had let Frey see his ever-building resentment towards her and the interfaced bid. His cost of living when others had died. The cost of being saved and funneled into a government organization to serve. The cost of who he had once thought was his soulmate. But Frey had lost that too. And instead of being understanding when Wyatt had wrenched up that hidden home video, of giving Frey the time and respect to process that unexpected blow, Jasper had thrown Panda in her face. He should have been the bigger person. He should have looked after her like she had done for him. He should have understood. Jasper looked across to Fergus. I'm an asshole. Fergus sighed before answering. May have ventured a bit too far, I imagine. Taking a breath to steady his still vibrating nerves, he attempted to follow after Frey only for Isaiah to bar his way with a gentle hand. I will go, Isaiah's deep velvet voice announced. And with that, he exited after Frey, leaving Jasper behind in a pool of growing guilt. Tangle webs around your neck will hang you out to dry in Hollywood. You have been listening to episode seven of Interface, the Creator's Champion. This series is a Red Empire production and a Sound Vision Gold Coast original production and has been written by Amy Casey, Ellie Popov, and Simon Kennedy. This series is produced by Amy Casey and Roberto Molini. Executive produced by myself, Charles Jazz Terrier, Ellie Popov, Steve Chickerel, Wade Boys, and Sherry Hamrock Rewell. It is co produced by Alex Contis and Tom Cramsey. Editing, sound design, and music is done by Roberto Molini and Tom Cramsey. Our production partners are the scandalous but always effervescent Organic Media Group. 
and that theme song you keep hearing belongs to my co-host, Ellie Popov. As you return to your mundane little lives, listeners, my advice to you all is to keep track of our next episode drop. Future information about the series can be found at www.redempireproductions.com. And don't forget to follow and subscribe to us via whatever streaming platform you're listening to us on. Join us again. Live beyond your understanding. Mark my words, I'll find the light.